Debbie McCuskey, who will also, of course, be a candidate for governor in the upcoming Republican primary, which is a powerful and growing field. And uh, more names are added to it, it seems, as uh, each week flows by. JB just walked into the studio a second ago here. He just got a little caught up with some stuff on the roads one way or the other. Bill, getting in the door. Very nice. JB, grab that mic, pull it closer. And say good morning to yourself. We pull, move off to the sides because this camera can't see your face. If you that one? No, that's move right it to here. your that left right ear. Move it, yeah, move the mic over by your left ear. There we go. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, we'll get. We'll get. To. I was trying to get out of the hotel, and there's a bunch of kids from Woodrow Wilson uh, who were playing tennis, and it's hard to. Oh. Sometimes, sometimes you talk to. They're to, playing tennis in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> well, they might have been. Uh, it was, you know. High school kids in, in hotels occasionally stay up a little later than other people do. But uh, uh, yeah. they're playing Martinsburg today. So we were just chatting. Sorry I'm late. Hey, very nice. Hey, we understand. So uh, the field of uh, governor, the candidate for governor, has gotten a little bit more crowded over the last uh, couple of days, as Patrick Morrissey has also announced he would be a candidate for the field. He said he's, he's uh, uh, a conservative and uh, the only real conservative in the race. Uh, Dele uh, Delegate Eric Halsorder, the House Majority Leader, also described Patrick as the, the, the true conservative in the race. Is that offensive to you? Um, no, I, I try really hard not to use pejorative statements as, as much as I can. I mean, Patrick has, has been an effective attorney general in, in some respects, in many respects, actually. Um, I, I, he's obviously a conservative guy, too, but I, I think to, to chastise the rest of the field as uh, apparently not being as conservative or not being truly conservative is, un, is, is probably not quite fair. Um, so, you know, that, that's how campaigning works, is, is people... You know, they try to make themselves look as good as possible, and that's how the, that's how the game is played. So good for him. All right. Let's talk about your accomplishments as auditor yeah. in the state of West Virginia. Uh, tell us, uh, from the beginning, when you've been elected and, and through re-election to today, some of the biggest accomplishments that you are proud of. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that we've done is that we have transformed our state into the most transparent state in the entire United States. How so? So, so we have... Uh, our, our office has a duty to the taxpayers and to the legislators to tell everyone how their money was spent. And I think over the last hundred years or so, as the bureaucracy has grown and uh, you have legacy politics, you have people that stay for a really, really long time. Um, one of the ways that you can prevent people from knowing um, what your failures are is by hiding the information about what you're spending money on. And so we endeavored on day one, six years ago, to to change that and to make our taxpayers the most informed electorate in the United States. And so what we did is we created something called the West Virginia Checkbook. And since that time, it has grown into a multifaceted um, information portal for every single West Virginian who wants to hold their government accountable for their actions. And so what you can do if you get on the West Virginia Checkbook is you can see how every one of your dollars is spent in real time. If you're in one of our 44 county partners, you can see how all your county dollars are spent. You can see how every single school board dollar is spent from all 55 county school boards. We have um, tools for you to see how all the ARP money was spent, how all the CARES Act money was spent, how all the road bond money was spent. We have tools for you to see how um, all of your economic development money is spent. We have tools for you to be able to see why drug prices are changing. Uh, and importantly, we have a, a really unique and first of its kind uh, budget book tool. So the legislature just finished uh, six weeks ago and they passed a budget. And so in West Virginia, you can download the entire budget in a searchable uh, database. And so you can go line by line through every single uh, department and you can see what their budget was this year, last year, and then going back five years before then. Uh, with the idea being that we need to get towards um, something that I like to call results-based budgeting. And, you know, my biggest frustration as auditors, we have pushed the bureaucracy and pushed the bureaucracy to stop asking for more money and start um, telling us why they're failing without using that as a crutch, right? That the idea that every single problem in government needs to be solved by more spending stops with me. And I can tell you, um, that we unfortunately fail at the sort of the three most important things that, that our government's supposed to do, and that's infrastructure and education and, um, and, and taking care of those who are the least capable of taking care of themselves. And, and that doesn't mean there aren't great people working at that. We have amazing teachers, amazing principals. We have incredible CPS workers at DHHR. Um, and we have, you know, state road workers and people at the Water Development Authority. There's lots of great people, but the processes are all designed to support the bureaucracy as opposed to create a taxpayer-centered 
customer centric uh, bureaucracy that that delivers results. And so um, the idea here is, is we spend five billion on schools and seven billion on DHHR and the federal government just gave us 13 billion dollars to redo our uh, our water and sewer infrastructure and, and our general infrastructure. And I know that was sort of a long winded response, but, th- but mm-hmm. the end of that is this. It's that we spend enough, right? We spend enough. And if we commit ourselves to data analysis, to process improvement, and to, to being humble enough to say we aren't getting the job done and we're going to fix it without spending more money, that's the next great step. And, and what's really cool about what we've done in my office is that we asked for $500,000 less this year than we did six years ago when I started. And we have 25% less employees when I started. We've added 1,000 audits to our team. Our audit process is 2,000% faster. We've created the Public Integrity and Fraud Unit, which has convicted 44 people of felony fraud for stealing money from the taxpayers. Uh, We created that from whole cloth. We have completely revamped our land sale process. We've gotten $30 million appropriated to tear down dilapidated buildings. We have um, worked through our securities division to offer a myriad of new services to seniors who are working on their investment portfolios. And so we are doing an enormous amount more with less money and less people. And so what I'm telling you is, is it's possible because I've done it. That you have to commit yourself to reforming your process before you ask for more money. Now, you don't have, uh, you're not the auditor of state government uh, per se. They have, there's another person who does that. You are in charge mostly of local governments. So I audit every single state payment and mm-hmm. I do all of the state's payroll. So my job, the the audit function that I have as it relates to state government is to make sure that every single invoice that's paid is legal, has the appropriate documentation, the appropriate contract, and is, has a legal purpose and an appropriation from the legislature. And so we have to process, depending on the week, but I would say it's an average of about 25,000 invoices per week. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the, uh, this is kind of off where we are right now, but tell me about the situation with Governor Justice and the garnishment of wages. You know, I, I would prefer not to talk about that. As, as the payroll administrator for the state, um, you know, we handle a lot of garnishments for a lot of state employees. And, and Jim Justice is no different than, uh, you know, the, the, the person who got into credit card debt at DHHR or, mm-hmm. or any other person whose payroll that I administer, their information is private. And that was, we... We weren't the people that told anyone that that happened. That came from, I believe, the bank. Uh, And the only reason we even responded is because we were asked. And our response was, is we will treat the governor of the state of West Virginia the same way we treat every other state employee. So this wasn't some campaign uh, stunt by the the McCuskey people who were running for governor? Categorically, no. Um, My preference would be for all of people's payroll information to be private as much as it can be. And and this is a dispute between the governor and and somebody else. And and if it were up to me... uh, that that would be that would have been handled in in a different way. Can you tell me what the process and procedure is before something like that happens? Yeah, you, you can so take that I can individuals do. out of the case. Sure, and so this is and again this is for everybody. This is how this happens for everyone, and it happens not infrequently. Um, and creditors just apply um, to be put on first and second, third in in line. Frequently, people that have one garnishment have more than one. And so there's a a myriad of state regulations about what percentage of the payroll you can take. You can't take the whole thing, um, which is smart, right? You don't want creditors coming in and taking somebody's complete livelihood away. Um, And then we apply what is the court-ordered garnishment uh, to their payroll in the way that the the court asks us to. And frequently, um, especially at the beginning of the year, we have to uh, answer creditors' questions about why they weren't first in line. And it's really just a race to the courthouse. Before the garnishment actually is enacted, how many attempts have there typically been to get a person to pay a debt? I have absolutely no idea. You just that, know that, the end result. That's I, We act at, at the behest of the court in this instance. <clears throat> Very good. Bill Stubblefield. Good morning, JB. Bill, good how to you see doing, you buddy? Again. It's great Very to good. see you, too. I, I got to spend the day at Shepherd yesterday. I understand that. This Very morning good, as yeah. well. Along with Mike Height. I think Mike was there as well. Yes, so, he yeah. was. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, as you... As you're considering running for governor, I'm sure you have the big picture as far as, as well as the small picture. What would you consider, if you're successful in running for governor, what would be the greatest legacy that you'd hope to leave after oh, when you step down from governor? Uh, Ju- uh, governor Justice, I think the roads have been one of his, and also the way he attacked the COVID. But the roads are the one that I would view as his legacy. What would yours be? So... The single most important duty that we owe to our citizens 
is to prepare our children properly. And I think we have to make, in 2023, the world is a very, very different place. And we, and we spent all day yesterday talking about early childhood development. And the amount of growth that happens between the ages of one and four in children is absolutely astounding. And the data as it correlates to how much educational opportunity, how much nutritional opportunity, and how much interactive opportunity are toddlers getting, and then how in their, invariably successful they are later in life is astounding. And through the drug crisis, through um, what is continues to unfortunately be a, a pretty significant amount of poverty in our state, we have a lot of little kids who are being generally ignored by the grownups in their life. And I think if we can make ourselves the single greatest place on earth for a young family to have a two and three year old, I'm talking about child care services, I'm talking about health care services, and I'm talking about the ability to begin kindergarten in a healthy, um, well-adjusted and well-nutritioned way, we can leave a legacy that 25 years from now, we're gonna be looking at an entire group of students that graduate from high school in a completely different way. What, what we know is, is that kids that are neglected when they're little end up uh, very frequently being um, having a lot of government interaction when they're older. Let's just leave it at that. And it is our duty, I think, to those children to find ways to make sure that they get a great start in life. And so both uh, the educational attainment of our students, the ability for our young families to afford childcare so that they can go to work, so that they can start businesses, and a real concentration on how do we protect the most vulnerable children in our entire society and give them a real opportunity at the beginning of life, that would be a legacy that um, I, I would, it would, it would make me so proud to know that, that we had accomplished that here. And, and, you know, there's so many other things that yeah, we have to do. Yeah. But for me, when you look at a two-year-old whose parents aren't teaching them how to walk and read and learn and laugh and do all those things, and unfortunately there's thousands of those across this state, yeah. that's that's it for me. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that'd be a, a phenomenal legacy to leave. Uh, but is it practical to do this, or is it more aspirational? It's both practical, necessary, and aspirational. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, from a marketing standpoint, when you look out at the rest of the world and you say, this is the place for you to bring your family. Is I can think of no better way to, to send that message than to create a program that says that children are the single first thing that we are always going to focus on. Your children are our priority. Your family success is our priority. So you can say to the world, that's what we do. Then the practical effect of it is, is our kids are gonna learn better, right? Our teachers are gonna have an easier time teaching kids. We, we hear all the time that, that the classrooms are constantly being disrupted. Teachers have an impossible time managing the behavior of certain kids in their classrooms, and it makes learning difficult for everybody. Well, all of those things start when kids are really little, and teachers know that, principals know that. Everybody understands this problem. There are 30,000 West Virginia families right now looking for daycare options, and there isn't even a spot for them. So if you, so think about when we talk about our workforce problems, right? If you're sitting at home right now and you're a single parent with a three-year-old kid and there's three jobs waiting for you, if there's no daycare option, guess where you go? You don't go to work, right? You don't go to work. And so we have, in my opinion, a responsibility to solve this problem so that we can get our hardworking taxpayers back to work who want to. And to be fair, there's so many grandparents that have taken on this responsibility. And while I'm, I know that my dad loves taking care of my kids, there's a, there is an end of life um, pathway that doesn't typically involve raising kids. And so we also owe it to an enormous amount of our seniors to give them these options so that they can go live the retirement life that they wanted to, right? So th this problem is all-encompassing. It all really starts and ends with the, with the drug crisis, if we're being totally honest. But its root cause is less relevant than the fact that it needs to be accomplished, and it has to be accomplished right now. Mike Height, as in Delegate Mike Height. Good morning, JB. I, I want to talk a little bit. I want to go back. You were there, to, so you you can uh, confirm I, I, my my you're allegations. Uh, absolutely there. right. And and to to talk about that a little bit, um, the the daycare centers or the the they they've sort of morphed from like a a babysitting service to the early childhood yeah. 
education service that it is now. Um, so I think there's a lot of differences uh, of where it was 20, 25 years ago and where it is now and the responsibilities that those individuals take on. Um, so I would agree with you. There's a lot, of, a lot of need there and we need to address it. I want to go back though and talk to you a little bit about the, the crowded field. Yeah. And this is this is one of, it's not just a crowded field, but m one of the most exceptional fields I have seen in a long time of quality, and I mean high quality candidates. They are exceptional, uh, including yourself. Um, so I'd like to know what is it that J.B. McCuskey can do to set himself apart? What is it that makes you rise above the other exceptional candidates? Yeah, so, um, you know, I would agree with your first statement. And it, it is uh, not in my typical nature to, to sort of answer a question like this. But, um, you know, the other guys have done a lot of great stuff. Uh, but for me, there's a couple things I think that stand out. One, in my role as auditor, I have a really unique insight into all of the government, the entire bureaucracy, every agency, every functionality, and also a very, very significant window into why failure happens. And so there isn't another person in the field who is more ready from an executive standpoint to lead a 30,000 person bureaucracy whose task it is to ensure that every single West Virginian's life tomorrow is better than today. And so there are people here who have great traits and who have accomplished things and good things for the state, but none of them are as ready to lead the, the state as I am. And I think when you look through the accomplishments that we've uh, made in the auditor's office, uh, when you talk to the people on my staff, uh, when you talk to other bureaucrats, people who uh, at first were a little potentially put off by my relentless uh, desire for their process to improve, for their cost to go down, and for their effectiveness to go up, um, you'll understand that that there's something about the way that, that I am able to push uh, organizations to be better, to work faster, to work better, and to truly love what they're doing and understand why they're doing it, that, um, you know, that that to me is it. And, and I mean, I think on a, on a greater level, when we're looking out at the rest of the country and we're saying, how do we get you to move here? Um, you know, my wife and I have a story that I can tell. And, you know, we have a small business and two little kids in public school, and I've lived in this state my entire life. Our business was shut down by the government during the pandemic, right? We were told we were non-essential. The next time a government official looks at any business owner, per any business owner, and says, your business is non-essential, we should all riot. Every business is essential. We almost went bankrupt because of the way that the government reacted to COVID. And I would say that, you know, the reaction was whatever it was, but all the cronies got their businesses to be open. I can give you a list of non-essential businesses who were found essential, and then I can send you a name of the lobbyist who went down and made sure that their businesses were allowed to stay open. So we ended up with, with six-figure debt because the government wouldn't let us sell our, our goods, right? And so when we go out and we talk to families in Baltimore and Dallas and Raleigh and DC and we say look move your family to West Virginia I can tell them why that experience is amazing for me and the reason is is because we have a value set that it, you cannot purchase every state in the country is telling people to move their families right every single state in America there's 49 other states that say this is the best state in America for your family well I'm here to tell you that they're all wrong and the reason is is there isn't another place where your neighbors will actually care about your success. This is the last place in my mind where we have a universal set of conservative values that enable all of us to get along, right? But more than that, you're five minutes from school, you're five minutes from church, you're five minutes from soccer, you're five minutes from the grocery store, and what we really are selling you is a lifestyle. You're surrounded by people who believe in you, believe in your, ex believe in, in, in your ability to earn a living and to, to support your family, and we're going to give you an extra 15 months with your kids, right? So when I when my kids turn 18, I got friends that live in D.C., I got friends that live in Dallas, I got friends that live in Raleigh, all these places, right? When you add up how long it takes them to do everything in their life, you know, I'm going to get an extra year and a half with my kids when they leave for college. That is an invaluable thing. Um, and they all left for what? Why'd they leave? $5,000 more, right? maybe, right? Oh, well, they don't even have a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods or whatever it is. You know what? Martin's is fine. Yeah. 
Martin's is fine. And every single per family that's sitting around with a 10 and a four year old in one of these big cities, I guarantee you is saying to themselves, what is the single place in this country where I can go have an affordable house that's close to a great school, surrounded by people who care about me, my family and my future. And for me, that's this place, right? You can't buy that. Yeah. You have to tell that. And I think that in this, in this race, I am the best messenger to go out to the country and sell that story and to sell that product. I want to go back real quick to something you said earlier about uh, the state of West Virginia. We spend enough, and, and I would agree we do. We spend enough. Um, but you have to recognize that we're in a crisis in certain areas, correctional yeah. officers, yes. uh, some places in DHHR, like direct care workers, um, teachers still need uh, to, to earn a living wage. Um, so where does that money come from, and how do you – find areas that that are maybe spending too much and and you decrease what they're getting how do you how do you do that so we can spend the money in the right place yeah so you're making an, an incredible point right it's not about uh it's not about need it's about resource allocation and so two things have to happen we have to commit ourselves like i said before to data analysis and process improvement we have begun uh, a first of its kind data project in West Virginia where we have enabled every bureaucracy to hand us every single bit of data that they have and enable us using a, a, a myriad of very, very advanced techniques. Techniques, listen to me. Still early, right? It is techniques, early. <laughs> techniques. And find where the, the issues are. Uh, you know, I spent some time working at the Pentagon and one of the things that we, we were working on was installing something called Lean Six Sigma throughout uh, many of, of the military bases around the country. What Lean Six Sigma does is it finds the process in, um, imperfections that cause end result delays. Um, and I think when somebody has committed themselves to the idea that we can be better, we can do better, we can be faster, which I don't believe we've had anybody that's truly committed themselves to changing the way these things are done. That's how it starts. It starts with an understanding that we aren't getting the job done and we can do it for the same amount or less. Uh, and then the second thing you have to do is reprioritize, right? You just mentioned, so first of all, uh, you just said corrections, right? Well, I mean, you would know as well as I do that there was a whole lot of money that could have very easily gone to the corrections department out of federal spending that did not. It was diverted to something else. Am I wrong? Nope. I don't want to get into it. But no, to state the fact, it's Marshall's baseball field. Correct. And I don't beleaguer Marshall. I'm glad they got a baseball field. But the fact of the matter is, is that that money was supposed to go somewhere else. I didn't, this, this wasn't some giant witch hunt, right? This was, interestingly enough, all the data on this was found on the checkbook site. When you make public information available publicly, things that shouldn't happen ha don't happen anymore, right? And so when you look and you look down your list of priorities, great leaders have the ability to say, I can't do this anymore. One of the most important things that a great leader does is says, no, say, I have to accomplish this task. So number one, we have to educate our children. Number two, we have to make sure that we're taking care of our seniors and people who can't take care of themselves. Number three, we have to provide water, sewer, internet, you name it, infrastructure to every single person in West Virginia in a way that enables them to, to complete their tasks, to do their business, to live their life, right? So you cannot move to issue four until issues one, two, and three are done and funded properly, right? And so what happens, I believe, and what I've seen in my life in, in government is that poor leadership says yes to everybody. And then you just keep piling tasks on and piling tasks on, and then it's a death by 10,000 cuts. Then you're spending a million dollars here and 500,000 here and, and 200,000 here on all these things that the government is inherently bad at accomplishing, right? There's a bunch of things that we shouldn't be doing at all. If there's no way for the government to accomplish it better than the private sector, the private sector should do it. What is it? Mitch Daniels said, if you can find it in the yellow pages, the government shouldn't do it. Um, and so it, it really takes uh, a level of, of self-confidence and leadership to have people walk in your office with really meaningful projects, right? Things that really should be getting done and say, I can't do that for you because I have to do these four things or these three things first. And that's, that is... Interestingly enough, probably our greatest task going forward. And, you know, I got to work a lot with Senator Tarr um, this session, and the way that he handles the budget process is very, very similar to that. Um, you know, he is somebody who 
Some people walk out of his office unhappy about their funding request, but none of them are unhappy about the communication. None of them are unhappy about the time that was spent, and all of them understand that if a time comes when, the, when money becomes available for that, that they'll do it. But the ability to say no to somebody and the ability to call your total tasks until you complete the necessary ones properly, right? It's not enough just to do it. It's not enough to just say, oh, look, we did it. You have to do it right. And that's our, that is where I believe um, leadership comes in. We're almost out of time. Bill, you had another question? No, it's okay. We we'll run. It's a... All right, then I'll ask a quick one here because you opened up the door when you brought up the Marshall baseball field. So it's money that was sent someplace where uh, it wasn't initially intended to go. You're the state auditor. What power do you have over that type of expenditure? And what are your responsibilities and duties when you see an expenditure like that, if you have any at all? So that, to me, is a, it is a priority problem. It isn't a legal problem. So when we receive funding requests, right, so the governor sends an appropriate request out of an appropriate account. It is not my, I'm actually not allowed to not spend money that's being spent legally. And, and you know, the, the federal government will determine whether it was spent by the guidelines. What we did is we made sure uh, that the public and the legislature had access to the data so that they can complete their task, which is, I think, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That is, that's a legislative auditor's function and a legislative function. And, and the only way that the entire government operates properly is when we don't silo information. And when those who need to know something have in immediate, full access to everything that's happened, and that's what we did. JB, what, uh, the, what are the rest of your plans uh, for today? Are you still in the Eastern Panhandle, or you headed back? So we got um, meetings all morning, and then I'm going to head back this afternoon and hopefully get home in time to pick my kids up from school, which Very would be nice. a great afternoon. 